But we've found that prayer is talking with God. We walk and talk together in his presence. Even Bible study is done with prayer in his presence. Prayer must not be what we do, but who we are. It's a, it's a lifestyle. But how do we do all of this, the things that we've considered uh, today, in our, in our day? Our life today is totally different to those in Bible times. But is that really true? People in those days led busy lives also. People worked long hours. Mums in Bible times also had kids. And, and time was not their own either. Their day was not nine to five. In the end, it's a choice. It's a matter of priority. Now, let me illustrate with the example of people who lived a God-conscious life within an environment similar to our own. And, of course, I'm speaking about the book of Ruth. And I'd like to just go through the book of Ruth, walk through it, and highlight how these people lived. Okay, Ruth, and we'll begin at chapter 1. Look how conscious of God these people were, how they lived in his presence. In Ruth chapter 1, and we look at verse 8, after the death of her husband and her two sons, Naomi decides to return to Bethlehem. And it says in verse 8, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house. Yahweh deal kindly with you, as he, ye have dealt kindly with the dead and with me. Yahweh grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. And so Naomi invokes Yahweh's blessing upon her two daughters-in-law. And she also asks him to bless those two daughters-in-law with a new husband and family. And see how natural it was that she just brings him into these things. And then we have Ruth's beautiful response in verses 16 to 17. But we look at verse 17 where she says, Where thou diest will I die, and there will I be buried. Yahweh, do so to me, and more also, if all but dead, part thee and me. She too invokes Yahweh as a witness to her pledge. And see how naturally she brings him into her interactions. They enter into Bethlehem, and the women gather around, and Naomi says unto them in verse 20, she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and Yahweh hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing Yahweh hath testified against me, and the Almighty hath afflicted me? See again how naturally Naomi speaks about God to her neighbours. Is she told of God's hand in her life and the grief that he has brought into her life because of what she and her family had done? Now, we are introduced to Boaz, so what is he like? Chapter 2 and verse 4. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, Yahweh be with you. And they answered him, and Yahweh bless thee. That's how they greeted each other. They brought Yahweh into their greetings. Now look how he speaks to Ruth in verse 12. Yahweh recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. And so he seeks God's blessing upon her. They, he, they bring God into everything. And when Ruth returns with all her gleanings and that which Boaz had given her, Naomi's response in verse 20 was, Blessed be he of Yahweh who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Her automatic response, it was from Yahweh. 
And when Ruth asked Boaz to perform the rite of the near kinsman and marry her in chapter 3 and in verse 10, he says, Blessed be thou of Yahweh, my daughter. Again, he's invoking blessings from Yahweh upon Ruth. And then says in verse 13, at the end of that verse, and if he, the unnamed kinsman, will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of the kinsman to thee as Yahweh liveth. And he brought God into his promise. And in chapter 4, Boaz finally offers to take Ruth to wife, and he calls upon everyone there to witness what he promised. And here's the people's response. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 11. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. Yahweh make the woman that has come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephratah, and be famous in Bethlehem, and let thy house be like the house of Pharis, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which Yahweh shall give unto thee of this young woman. So the people invoke Yahweh's blessing upon the couple and express their confidence that God would give them seed. And when it came, in verse 14, and the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. Now look at how these people lived. They lived before God. And they brought God into their lives, into their language, into their daily interactions, in everything. They're continuously invoking him in greetings, blessings, promises, and thanksgivings, and blessings of God. Now, can you imagine speaking like that today in this, our world? We barely mention God, especially in public or in the workplace. <laughs> But what even about brothers and sisters speaking to each other? <clears throat> and yet this, brothers and sisters, was in Bethlehem in the time of the judges. And if you know anything about Bethlehem in the time of the judges, it was totally depraved. You only have to look at the appendices of the book of Judges, and it's all in Bethlehem. And the wicked and evil things that were practiced. <clears throat> Their behavior was against the grain. So it's possible to live like this in this kind of environment. If we choose in faith. Now we've seen in our studies that prayer is involving ourselves with God. But what should we expect from God? In response to our prayers, should we expect answers? And by answers to prayer, we, we usually mean getting what we want. And we get upset when it doesn't happen that way. Now, we would like answers to prayer to be not only what we want, but immediate. We just like it to happen now. And, you know, the Bible actually indicates that God does respond to our prayers immediately. I want you to turn with me to Daniel chapter 9. We've used Daniel several times now, but just look at what it says here in Daniel chapter 9. And he set his face unto God to seek by prayer and supplication. And the record says, I prayed unto Yahweh my God and made confession, verses 3 and 4. And then in, in verse 20, it says, And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before Yahweh my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer. Yeah, I, I don't know how many times... He needs to reiterate the point that it was while he was speaking. Even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision of at the beginning, 
being caused to fly swiftly, taps me about the time of the evening oblation, the time of prayer. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I came to show thee. And so it goes on. So the angel Gabriel interrupts Daniel's prayer, and he tells him that God immediately he started praying. Said Gabriel. It's as if God couldn't wait. It shows that God knows what we are going to ask before we ask. Just as the Lord said in Matthew 6, verse 8. Now, here's another event showing the same immediate recognition of Daniel's prayer. But the response is different in chapter 10. In chapter 10 and verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And on the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hiddekel, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen whose loins were girded, with fine gold of Euphrates. So Daniel was mourning for three full weeks, as he describes it. And while he fasted and prayed, and he was praying the whole time, it says that in verse 12. But look at what the angel says, verse 12. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but though Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, and so on. So God heard Daniel's prayer at the beginning of the three full weeks. But the angel could not respond before he finished more pressing work. Daniel's needs were significant, but there were higher priorities. And that's something we've got to learn, brothers and sisters, that God is working on many matters. Not just ours. Sometimes he requires other things to occur before our prayers can be answered. Now, I take from these examples that God hears our requests and decides immediately, but not necessarily when or even if we should receive what we request. Not everything that we ask for will be a yes. The answer can be a no. Remember David praying for his child and he, he mourned in, in sackcloth and ashes, throwing himself on the earth he wouldn't eat because he believed in God, the possibility, as Christ said, all things are possible to God. But the answer was no. So I, I learned from this, brothers and sisters, that we must accept the consequences of our actions. There are times when it can only be no. Or well, we have the example of the Apostle Paul who prayed three times that the thorn be taken from him. But the answer was no. Sometimes we must suffer for our own good as Christ told the Apostle Paul. Or the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden, he also prayed three times that the cup pass, but the answer was no. Sometimes we must suffer for the good of others. We are in good company, brothers and sisters. Far greater people than you and me have had their requests denied. 
but always for a good reason. And each of these humbly accepted the answer of God, and so should we. Sometimes we get what we ask for, but is it really what we need? Come with me to our reading in James chapter 5. James 5, and in the uh, verse 16, and the second part of that verse, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much, and James anticipates his readers thinking, well, how can I consider myself to be righteous? So he gives an example. So he says in verse 17, Elijah, Elijah was a man subject to like passion as we. But this man, he said, if I be a prophet, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. And it did. He's like the word of God made flesh. And it said, continues, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. There's nowhere in the record of kings that it says that, that it was Elijah's prayer. But James says it was Elijah that asked for that to happen. Elijah did this. It was his idea, not God's. And we know from James and from elsewhere that, that Elijah's motive was that the people return to their God. He desperately wanted that. And God heard him. And he stopped the rain. And when he thought the time was right, he, he, he called for a contest on Mount Carmel. And, and when the prophets of Baal didn't succeed, he scoffed at them. And then when it was his turn, he, he uh, built the altar and, and then he gave this beautiful, simple prayer that God consumed the sacrifice. And it did. Fire came down from heaven. And Elijah is elated. And all the people are with him, and off with the heads of the prophets of Baal. And, 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 and he tells Ahab, you better get ready. The rain's coming. He's so confident. And he goes up onto Mount Carmel. And he throws himself on the ground, and he has his head between his knees, and he prays unto God. And he tells the seven, go up to the top and see what you see. And there was nothing. And seven times he does it. And finally, verse 18, it says, and he prayed again. And the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. And Elijah is on a high. And Yahweh and his people, they're united. And this was all he wanted, to bring them back to their God. He's so full of elation that he, he runs before Ahab's chariots. But it takes the word of one woman to send his world crashing. It didn't work. All his plans, all his thoughts of how it could go. God worked with him. God used what he had asked for to bring judgment upon his people. But he was working with Elijah too. And that's the same with us. His intentions were good. And he took Elijah to where Moses was to learn the same message, the lesson as, as, as Moses, that it's the still small voice, Yahweh's character expressed, not in the wind and the fire and the, and, and, and the earthquakes. The fact is, brothers and sisters, God still did hear the intentions of Elijah and he's going to come back and he's going to do that work of restoring his people to their God. He's going to do that. He has heard that prayer, but it's not how and when Elijah thought it should be. And it's the same with us, brothers and sisters. God is fully in control. He's working with us despite our limited understanding. He hears our prayers and he does what is best for our ultimate development and good. It's always with the latter end in mind. Now, another thing that we find difficult with uh, is how to interpret answers to prayers. 
we're, we're talking about providence, really, because, you know, that's how God works today. It's not by miracles, it's by, by providence. Sometimes I think, though, we think that there should be miracles, and we're expecting them. Our problem is interpreting, when it does happen, how to interpret providence. Everything we, we interpret tends to be how we want to. It's from our own point of view and to our advantage. Come with me to, uh, there are many examples we could use here, but 1st of Samuel chapter 24. Here's one good example. 1st of Samuel chapter 24. Now Saul entered into a cave to relieve himself. He thought he was alone, something that you would do privately. But David and his men lurked deeper inside that very cave. Now, God was obviously in this. Everyone could see that when it all came uh, to pass. David's men certainly saw it that way. And his men, in uh, 1 Samuel 24 and verse 4, they whispered to David, Behold, the day of which Yahweh said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. God had never said those words to David. These words were the interpretation of those men about providence. What had happened? It was clearly from God. The Hebrew goes like this. Lo, the day that Yahweh has said to you, Lo, I am delivering your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it shall seem good unto you. See, they were saying, God has brought Saul into this very cave where we are, so that you can do what you want with him. God's telling you, David, here's your opportunity. And David's reticent. And he says to his men in verse uh, 6, Yahweh forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, Yahweh's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of Yahweh. Now it's clear to everyone, including Saul, says the same, that God had brought him into David's hands. David saw it that way. His men saw it that way. This was of God. But for what purpose is the question? His men interpreted this as God gifting David with Saul's life. But David filters the incident through the word of God. And he comes to a different conclusion. So God was providentially working here with all of these people, with David's men, with David, with Saul. He was testing them. You see how God works on several things at once? And no doubt David had been praying for deliverance. And here it seems like God was at work, but he needed the word of God. So the thing is, is that principle triumphed over a self-centered interpretation of the hand of providence. David's men thought that God had sent a sign. And you often hear people saying, taking things as signs from God. There's a danger in looking for signs. Looking for signs can be yet another attempt for us to know that God is with me. It's this feeling that God is really there. Instead of trusting the word that he's there, we want these little indications that God is there. Now, I, can, I can tell you that the churches believe in these signs too. They get them. And all of these things happen. <clears throat> Among many people and people that aren't even religious, things are taken as signs and omens and so on. So how can you trust it? How do we interpret it? Okay, against what? What's the basis for interpreting those signs? There's only one basis. We know the word of God. That's what he's told us. Now, the Lord regularly confronted the dubiousness of sign seeking. The leaders and the people were always seeking signs from Christ. And twice he said this. 
An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. He had done so many miracles it wasn't funny. But they refused to accept them. They wanted some kind of a sign. He says that he will send the sign of the prophet Jonas, and they still did not believe. Why? He summed up their problem as those who put trust in signs and miracles rather than hearing the word of God. Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. But they still didn't believe. So what's the one stable thing we've got, brothers and sisters, except this book? We've got to believe that. Is God really interested in giving us little clues that he's there? He wants us to believe his word. Like any father preparing a son or daughter for life, developing our ability to make choices and take responsibilities are more critical than giving clues and playing mind games with his children. He wants us to make spiritual decisions. Now, we have seen that asking in Christ's name restricts petitions to the things he would want. Or in other words, as it's also expressed, if it's according to his will, let thy will be done, as we know. But does that mean, brothers and sisters, that... The only things that we can ask for are the things, well, that we know from the word about the kingdom, the things to do with God and, and, and Christ. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians 4, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. So does that mean really mean everything? Yes. You see, because God wants to be involved in every part of our lives. And we should want to God to be in every part of our lives. Look at this, the story of the book of Ruth. Look at how they involve God. But the point is, where are our lives focused? Is there anything on this list for which we should not pray? There's nothing on that list for which we cannot pray. But whatever we ask for must not be, as James says, to consume upon our lusts. Just for our own ease, for our own gratification. It's, if our lives are devoted to him, it's all about him. Our lives are devoted to him. Prayer involves our whole lives, every facet. It even comes down to our moods. Come back with me to James and chapter 5 again. James 5 and verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. So these are moods. Like those afflicted of old, as we saw yesterday. We can meditate upon God's character, his works, his word, and be encouraged. But we saw that meditation really is meditative prayer. And that's what he's getting at. Is any merry? Well, let him sing psalms. We speak to ourselves. That's meditation. In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in our hearts to the Lord, Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. That's meditation. We saw that yesterday is meditative prayer. Now, how immersive is our life and prayer and meditation to be? Our lives are to be conscious of God, talking to God and about God every living moment, which involve God in everything we do. Now, here's something else that we've been asked to do in our lives. It's at the heart of the royal law, to love our neighbor. And that's to pray for them. It's called intercession, praying on behalf of others. It's in verse 14. It says, is any sick among you? 
Let him call for the elders of the ecclesia and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And I believe this is dealing with the spiritually sick. And these are the elders of the ecclesia working with the spiritually sick because, you see, the spiritually sick feel so distant from God. They can't find him. They're struggling to get access. Will he listen to me? I, I feel so far from him. How can I approach him? And so they, 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 he says, go to the elders and they will pray over him. They'll do something else as well. It says they'll anoint him in the name of the Lord on the Lord's behalf. And while oil was used literally as a medicine, I believe it's symbolic here. Because he's, this is the spirit that James is alluding to, Leviticus 14, 10 to 18, about the restoration of the leper. It's symbolic of the word of God, that anointing him, gently soothing him with the word of God and prayer. There they are again together. And they pray over him. The idea is that their prayer is superimposed upon him so that eventually his prayer of faith will save the sick. And if there are sins, they will be forgiven. Now, this is what James says. Is this what happens in our ecclesias? Can any member of the ecclesia feel that they could go to the arranging brethren and open up to them about their spiritual weaknesses and, and, and ask for help in coming back? And they open their souls without condemnation. Well, then it says in verse 16, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. Now stop and think about what James is saying here. The literal Greek is this, be praying on one another's behalf that you all may be healed, forgiven. Now what kind of spirit is this, brothers and sisters? This is truly loving our neighbour. Do we have the, that kind of openness and that kind of humility within the ecclesia so that you can go and confess you have a problem with something or other and you need your brother's prayers and help with that problem without being looked down upon? Because the fact is he's saying you all ought to be doing that because we're all in the same boat. We've all got problems. doesn't matter how long we've been in the truth. How much knowledge we've got. What standing we have in the ecclesia. We've all got this problem. He says we're all on the same level here. And we should all be able to do this. This is what an ecclesia is meant to be like. And just as Christ intercedes on our behalf, so he wants us to intercede on each other's behalf. Paul often prayed for others, didn't he? We, we often mention this in his epistles. He's, he's constantly praying for others. And he asks others to pray for him in his work. But Paul doesn't just list off a whole lot of names. He gives the reasons why. So in our prayer list, we, they, they need to be more than just a list of names and mention them in our prayers. We need to know about each of those brothers and sisters. We need to keep up to date with them, to know where they are, so that we can pray meaningfully about each of them. We've got to become involved not only with God, but with them, as he is with them. We saw in our very first study that in all the Old Testament and New Testament words, there were two basic categories of prayer. There were prayers, which the word prayer means to ask. 
Uh, they express our need. And the other sort was praise, which expresses our involvement with God and his purpose. So I want in the last uh, few moments that we have to consider thanksgiving and praise. Because praise is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is come. And we ought to praise God. For there is none like him. But there's got to be more than this, doesn't there? You think about it. We praise an athlete for breaking a record. And we praise a pupil for coming first in class. Or we praise a hero for saving the child. But while we may be pleased with that person and admire them, it's not personal to us. It, it, it's simply something that we see as distinguished or remarkable. And that can be the same with God. We can be in awe of the miracles of the Red Sea or of the mountain on fire and shaking and the trumpet getting louder and louder. Amazing things. Or of Christ walking on the water or healing. So many people witnessed and rejoiced in all those miracles, but forgot when they came to the next well and found it to be dry. The praise born of thankfulness comes from a different place and has a different outcome. Giving thanks is a response. We thank someone because that person has done something for us. The thing done is the motivation for giving thanks. But it's not just about the gift, is it? It's also about the giver because of their thoughtfulness. So we say it's the thought that counts. So we give thanks to a person for their thoughtfulness. So there are two things. The gift and the thoughtfulness of the giver. And it's no different in the Bible. Now we've seen how Paul regularly gave thanks to God for brothers and sisters and always gave a reason. Well, here's three examples. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. That's why he gave thanks. Romans 1 verse 8. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification and so on. It's cause and effect. Paul thanks God for what God had done for these brothers and sisters. But it goes further. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In 2nd of Corinthians and chapter 9, and it's concerning the collection that Paul had organized for the poor uh, believers in Jerusalem, the Jewish believers there. The Jerusalem poor fund, as it's often called. And so he says in verse 11, now notice these words, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. In other words, he's speaking about the money, but it's more than that. Which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. It's cause and effect. Which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of the service not only supplies the want of the saints, but as a result is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Now the question here is, why would the thanksgiving be given unto God instead of those that gave? The givers. Well, it's a little obvious really, isn't it, brothers and sisters, because it's God that put that into their hearts. 
It's God that did that. It's because of God. His thoughtfulness. His gift. He says in verse 15, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. It's his gift. And that gift was Christ. And that gift was behind all their giving. Christ becomes the motivation because the gift is so valuable. It accomplishes so much. And once again, the thoughtfulness of the giver. Now, thankfulness is, is important to God. It's there in the law of, of, uh, of the, the sacrifices. There's a thanksgiving offering. It's the most important of all the offerings. Yeah, don't have time to look at that. But this is what he does say. Colossians 3, verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God or, the, or even the Father by him. Or first of Thessalonians, and chapter 5, verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Or in Colossians 3, verse 15, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. It's important to God. He's looking for a, a response. But the Father isn't looking for a perfunctory thanks in every prayer. Like a child with a mouthful of cake being told to thank the kind lady. It ought to be genuine and spontaneous. Come with me to Philippians chapter 4. We've looked at this passage several times now through our studies. We've mentioned it and it comes to life. But let's have a look at the context of this. Philippians chapter 4, verses 5 to 7. Now this, I'm going to translate it uh, as my own translation from the Greek. And it says this. The Lord is nigh. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by petition and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that exceeds all reasoning shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now, the point of each of those words for prayer there is not to indicate different types of prayer, but rather that they're all different words for petition, for asking God. It goes like this. In everything by, whoops, ah, I've gone backwards. There we go. See that? In everything by petition, supplication, request. They're all about petitions. And that's what we're like, brothers and sisters. Prayer is usually mostly about asking God because we've got such a great need and our lives are full of all these needs and wants and that we're desperately in need of God all the time. But what Paul says, make sure you don't forget to be thankful. We've got to remember, brothers and sisters, in those times, desperate times, and that's what he's speaking about, don't get anxious, but remember with all the asking what he's done for you, the gifts, what he's already given. Remember that and be thankful with your prayers and petitions. Remember that. The question is, why should we be thankful? Well, God has provided the gift, and of course we have that gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes uh, in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Gifts ought to bring a response. Because it's a gift that has accomplished so much. And it expresses 
the great thoughtfulness of our Heavenly Father. These demand a moral and heartfelt response. People, people talk about God's love not expecting anything in return. That's not true. He doesn't expect it, but he's looking for the ones that do respond just to say thank you. He does want that, brothers and sisters. Our problem is we do feel thankful, don't we? We, we? we feel thankful at this Bible school. Now, Now's the time we feel the most thankful. We're thankful to each other and we're thankful to our Heavenly Father for such a spiritual environment. And we go down the road and it starts to wane. I, I mentioned that picture once before, but that is what it's like, isn't it? It wanes. Our thankfulness becomes less genuine more and, and less spontaneous. It becomes more ritualistic because we know we should give thanks. So how on earth are we to remember the, the thoughtfulness of God and the greatness of his gift? How do you think God feels when we lose our thankfulness? Well, how do we feel when someone takes us for granted? It's like that little kid that's got a mouthful of cake and doesn't bother thanking the kind lady. How can then we maintain our thankfulness? Well, I think it's sort of obvious if we consider what we've been considering over our studies. It's the word of God. And it's, a, it, it's so obvious. It's meditation. It's constantly meditating on those things. We can only retain the effectiveness of God's gift and thoughtfulness with its response by constantly drawing upon the water through those roots into lives of fruitfulness. Have you ever wondered, brothers and sisters, why there is only two prayers that we have been told to give as an ecclesia? They're there. Paul was told, this is what you do, 1 Corinthians 11, to give thanks for bread, give thanks for wine, twice for the same offering. That's emphasis. He emphasizes the gift. And these prayers are given at the memorial meeting, a meeting of remembrance. Do this in remembrance of me. That's meditation. He's asking us to come to meditate on the gift that it might produce in us a response. Now, brothers and sisters, we have a lot to be thankful for. We ought to perhaps start a list out of thankful hearts for all the things that God has given, and we can meditate upon them. God is so wonderful, so wonderful in his thoughtfulness and in his gift. So through Jesus Christ, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name.